Welcome back. This week is week four of the consult for Jennifer Marie and week three for her husband, John. Thanks for tuning in and I hope you really enjoy what happens this week. During this visit, you'll see that Jennifer and John run into some of the exact same problems that many people on the ketogenic diet run into. It has very little to do with the carbohydrates they're eating or the amount of fat macros they've got. Instead, issues within life start to creep up, like how do you handle a holiday and what goes wrong when you can't sleep well or you start having pain. Tune in to see how we do some biohacking and how John handles his first 22 hour fast. We continue to use the teaching tools of ketones, of glucose, of this ratio, and how important the biohacking can be when you use these tools in your home. Please encourage Jennifer Marie and John. They're taking on this ketogenic journey and they're showing you the mistakes so that all of us can learn. It helps to provide these teachable moments and take you from the beginner level of a ketone diet to one that is sustainable lifelong. So thank them for their courage and I hope you learn something during this fourth consult. Hello everybody. If you are stuck on a weight loss journey, use, doing the keto diet, you need to watch this. Today we have Dr. Boz, John, and myself, Jennifer. Let me also say, if you guys can, Wish Dr. Boz a happy birthday. It was her birthday this week. Happy so, birthday. Yes, happy birthday. We hope you had a very good birthday. I did. Awesome. I did. Awesome. I tell patients they only get a, they get a cheat day only on their birthday. <laughs> right? <laughs> they can have a cheat day like once a year. Once a year, yeah. I, I <laughs> cheat with a co uh, chocolate chip cookie dough fat bomb recipe. That's what I cheat Ooh. with. <laughs> I need to move closer to you. I know. <laughs> hey, the recipe is pretty good, man. It's it's really good. If that's my cake, it's it's a good one. <laughs> anyway, mm. let's get started. So we, John and I, have been doing our fasting and uh, our our tracking of our numbers. We're tracking glucose. We're track tracking ketones. We use a blood meter that we track with. Um, let's start with talking about. Um, I know that when I track, I take the glucose number and I divide it by the ketone to get a ratio. And mm -hmm. I know for weight loss, I want to be under 80% to be in the weight loss zone. But you have other you have other measurements that I think you do. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So let's just talk about why. So when you first start on a ketogenic diet, there is no reason you need to do a, a blood test at all that when you first do this, if you if your body is making ketones, that isn't, I would say normal for the American, standard American diet. With the number of carbohydrates that are typically found in our diet, it is difficult to produce ketones in a way that you would actually make them come out your urine. In fact, one of the things on our blood test, on our urine tests in the lab is, oh, is the patient you know, what I, what I used to think of it as when I was in medical school was like, is, are they in starvation by having ketones? And mm. I know that's not true, but that was what the first thing my brain would do is like, oh, they haven't been eating or they, they're in starvation mode. And mm. that's not true, but urine ketones are cheap, easy, safe, portable. You don't need to poke your finger. Uh, and that is what most people should do until they have really adapted and gotten into a ketogenic, ketogenic life. What it measures is that there's enough ketones in your blood that they're having, they're spilling into your urine. And think of it as an overflow, overflow valve. Your, your body protects you against a major shift in chemistry. And the way it does that for ketones is it spills them into the urine. And when you pee on that little stick and it turns pink, it means, yep, there were ketones in that urine. Nice. Perfect plan. Nice. When you get to the part where you said, you know, doc, I've been eating keto for the better part of a decade or maybe a year or two or three, and I, I'm stuck. I can't seem to lose weight. I've got all the rules down. I've made all the life adjustments. I do keep my carbs low. What am I doing wrong? That's me. And that's where you, mm -hmm, and that's where you came in. So if you remember, I said, okay, if we're going to, I have lots of patients reach out and say, hey, doc, can I have some you know, can I, can I see you? Uh, can I see you for ketosis or can I, a ketogenic diet? I'm like, tune in on Sunday nights. Cause I'm coaching what most people need to hear when they are stuck on a ketogenic diet. 
So the first step is we need to take you up on the threshold, which is to check your blood, check your blood sugar and check your blood ketones. Yeah. So the first thing we had you do was we, you got one of those little monitors. And when you checked your blood sugar, you've actually had really good sugars. Usually I find that uh, in somebody in a ketogenic stall, they, in fact, if I think we would have checked your sugar before, before we started, it might have been even in the 90s a little bit. Was that true on you or not? You know what? It might have been, but I've, I've been doing keto been doing for a year and a half. And a half. So, so they might have been pretty good. I don't, I don't remember. Okay. Okay. So the, the first sugars, the blood sugars are, we want to get those at least into a, under 100 when you're fasting. So we started with that. And then we want to see how well is your body making ketones. And most of the time when people are on a stall that they can't lose any more weight, the time spent with no calories, we call that, you know, you can call it fasting, but it's time restricted to eating. They, they do not eat for 12 hours. And I mean, not the, oh, you can have bulletproof co coffee. Oh, you can have bone broth. No, I'm saying zero, but it's not like 48 hours worth of fasting. It's 12 hours a day, but it's strict. You get salt and water for 12 hours, and then you measure those numbers. So I have followed your rules to a T, and um, I don't have a pretty little screen print because I'm traveling and I'm not even at home, but my numbers have been in the 29, 38, 43, 34, 63, 59, 48 percentile, but there was one day I was super stressed and I had a major deadline and my numbers were 71%. That's my worst number, but I'm normally pretty good. They're normally within that range. So, so let's just unpack that so that the people understand. What does 71% mean for you? What was your sugar? What was your ketone? My sugar was 93% and I was strict keto, strict keto, no cheating, no sugar, mm -hmm. no nothing. And then my my um, blood my ketone was one point three, so that gave seventy one point five percent was my ratio. So there isn't anybody who's keto that would say anything except, "Oh, great numbers," yeah. okay? And that is after you haven't eaten for twelve hours. Those are really good numbers, but they're the worst numbers you had when we implemented. She's been keto. Her body knows how to make ketones. She knows how to use them. She is efficient. She has been in this phase for a long time. And as soon as you restrict the time that the food goes in, it's unbelievable how well that body starts to clean up and empty some more of that storage, which should turn into weight loss. So this is, I think, are we on week four? Week three or four? Uh, <laughs> I'm forgetting. I don't have my okay. notes. I'm not at home. That's but okay. John, John had an interesting thing. So we are going to, the next thing that I want to talk about is intermittent fasting since you dove into it a little bit. And that's what I do. I do a 12 hour fast, very minimal, very minimal. I stop eating at five in the afternoon and I drink coffee at between five and six the next morning. But, you know, um, I do want to talk a little bit about getting to autophagy. And then I do want to talk about intermittent fasting. But first I want John to give his numbers because he bravely did a 36 hour fast this week but i want him to share i want him to share that story a little interesting so i've done 20 22 hours before and no problem okay good job that was, uh, that was last week when you did that right was that was your first 22 hour fast was just two weeks ago right correct correct yeah yes. big steps so big steps wow I'll do a 36. So the difference between this time and the last time was I was busier at work. So I don't think I got enough water as I oh. should have. Um, Cause I was busy, but busy is good because I wasn't thinking about eating, but um, I had my, Oh, and I forgot my, my salt at home. Oh no. So I know how busy Jen, she had a deadline. I definitely wasn't even going to tell her I forgot him because she'd be like, okay, well, where are you at? I'm going to bring your salt. And I'm going to be like, don't worry about it because you got work to do. Anyway. That's a good wifey. So, yeah. I went by Walgreens and they didn't have any the Himalayan salt. I got like, I don't know, sea salt and it just wasn't the same. So anyway, so by the time I got home, I was taking more salt, drinking a lot of water. At the 24 hour mark, I checked my blood level in my... Glucose was 77, 
in my mm -hmm. ketone. This is 24 hours. It's 24, right, 24 hours, right? 24 okay. hours. Okay, 77. And my ketones were 2.1. So 77 divided by 2.1. That's a really good number. So you can tell you're a boy. 36, man. That's a ratio of 36. That's right. really good. How did you? And that's when you were feeling good or you weren't feeling good? I was good? feeling okay. At about the 25, 26 hour mark, I kind of had. I was kind of feeling sluggish and tired and hungry. So I went with Jen to go shopping at Tuesday morning for stuff. And, you know, I'm just kind of like, you know, just following her around. Um, we got home and about around the 28 hour mark, I got a boost of energy. Oh, okay. Which is great, right? But I'm trying to sleep now. I was going to say it's bedtime, isn't it? Correct. So yes. I toss and turn all night long. And I which I, you, I struggle with because of my knee pain, getting a comfortable position. Sure. That on top of mm -hmm. having a little bit more energy, I don't think I probably slept but a couple hours the whole night. Mm. Okay. So did you check your numbers the next morning? 36 hours. My numbers were horrible. <laughs> yeah. I wonder why. But I'm going to type in my calculator. What? 110. And my ketone level was 1.5. 1 1.5. Okay. So again, not horrible, but they are 70. So why, what did, what's your guess as to why your sugar was so high the next morning? I, cause I didn't sleep. I, yes. I was moving around. Yes, a lot. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. So this system is so complicated with this human body. It just does things and it doesn't like, read the textbook ahead of time. Actually, I did read the textbook. That's exactly what does happen is when you, one of the most powerful, stressful things that you can do to the human body, which is again, cortisol. Cortisol is what we do when we're stressed. It goes down when we sleep and it rises when we uh, go without sleep or when we're stressed. And that is the same as somebody giving you prednisone. Okay, prednisone is cortisol in a pill. So you've heard of people saying, hey, they went on prednisone and the sugars went up. I'm like, yep, that's how that works. So it's an amazing anti-inflammatory for short term, but its side effects are it shoots that sugar uh, up as a, as, a, as a, I mean, that's a response. Your body's stressed out. It says, hey, give me some sugar. I, I got to have fuel to burn. And that's what it does. So this is not uncommon. That first fast your body hasn't seen a fast of 36 hours ever, probably, right? Nope. So your body was like tweaking, like, what are you doing? You have transplanted me into a different human being. So the production of ketones is solid. I mean, those are really good ketone numbers. Uh, and if we would have checked when you weren't sleeping in the night, I tell people, if you, if you have insomnia, if, you, if, you, if you're on that first fast and you can't sleep, don't stay in bed. Just get up. Go water the flowers in the dark. I don't care. Do something besides sleeping because laying in that bed creates this cycle of it's a terrible habit, but it also your body has all this extra fuel. And if you're just laying there trying to white knuckle what to do with all this excessive fuel, um, it's a mismatch. Your body is still figuring out what it's like to fast. And so it overproduced ketones, expecting that you were going to, like, I don't know, hunt through the night in a hunter gatherer kind of setting. And so you would have had all the fuel you needed to go like kill the gazelle and I you don't know, do the, do the caveman thing. But what happens is you live in 2018. So you lay there in your comfortable bed and you get stressed going, oh, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. I can't sleep. And so here's the good news. As you practice the skill of fasting, this gets better. But what I would encourage you not to do is i probably get you a couple more 24 hour fasts in 25 hour fasts in before you do that again. Uh, the, the sad part is, is if, if you didn't have a life, <laughs> if you didn't have a job and you didn't have a kids and a, you know, you just you, uh, or let's just take this to an extreme. If you were my patient with cancer, I would tell you to push through. I would say, it's not going to hurt you. Your body will figure this out. You will figure out how to produce the amount of ketones that you use, even during fasting. But those first few fasts, they just shoot those ketones way up. They get excessive energy. And then all this other stuff happens. And they think, oh, I can't do fasting. My sugars went up. And really, it's just a stress response. Your body will figure it out. Uh, it's not deadly. It's just a sign that if we keep pushing you, 
they fall off the wagon. It's too much. It, it affected my sleep. I couldn't do a good job of my work the next day. My knee hurt because I didn't sleep. And then my sugars were crappy anyway. So why did, why did we do that? Uh, so instead of, I don't want to do that. I want you to succeed. So my recommendation for you would be saying, let's get two or three more 24 hour fasts. in." the good news is you felt good. That answered my question because I was going to ask you, should I stick with a 24 hour fast for a little while? And, and I'll do that. Yeah. And it's not for a chemistry reason. It is for a lifestyle. Can you be consistent? Don't push them too hard or they, it's too, it's too much. It's too, right. they, they fall off for like social economic reasons if you would. So let's mm. have, we have a couple of questions. First of all, um, this is an easy one. Somebody is asking why the salt and I, I could not do a fast without the salt. The salt, um, surprisingly enough, the salt, keto is flushing, so you're getting ready of lots of liquids, and the salt helps to keep liquids in you, which is very important. But also, pink Himalayan salt has so many minerals that your body needs, needs that now I find myself craving salt. So everybody thinks, oh my God, you're eating salt, you're gonna get bloated. No, I carry rock salt in my pocket on the go because oddly enough, when you're fasting, you can eat a little rock salt and it gives your mouth something to do and it gives it an amazing sensation. And oddly enough, it curbs your appetite too. Mm. It's so, very good, yeah. Your, your body flushes when you first go ketogenic and that flushing is, it, in order to get that liquid out, it has to, your kidney has to use those, those uh, salts, sodium, yeah. potassium, magnesium, you're wasting them. And when you get them down, it's very irritable on your brain and you get lightheaded uh, the salt is amazing to get through a, a, a wave of hunger too. It's, it, it it's sounds important. Goofy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's another question. And, um, Michael asked, how can I stop feeling constipated trying keto? Now I have an answer that has always worked for me and I don't, I would love okay. to hear yours. So my, Let's see what you think. my answer is too much protein with not enough fat in doing keto will always constipate you. It does me. I've been doing this a long time. Too much fat will um, give you diarrhea. So you have to have a very um, good balance between protein and fat to get to that level to where you're perfect. Now, I want to hear what you say about that. Well, I'm gonna, I look carefully at Michael's question where he says he's trying keto. So I usually find that when they get constipated in the first part of a ketogenic diet, it is a major change in the way they eat. So if you've been on the standard American diet or even a paleo diet, or even, you know, you've been healthy, but you know, not 300 carbs a day, maybe let's say 70 carbs a day, which is still pretty low carb, but not, not keto. When mm -hmm. they transition to a ketogenic diet, they, there's usually a lot of that fiber has left the stage. And um, in most bowels, when they first transition, specifically those people who depend on what we call the stretch factor to move their stools. So mm -hmm. in, in the bowel, there's two things that, well, there's, about, there's several, but let's think of the two major things that move your stools along. One of them is bulk. So that's why we say, hey, if you eat fiber, you're going to have a bowel movement. You know, that fiber is good for your bowel. Well, there's a lot of caveats to that. The fiber stretches the bowel, which stimulates the movement of the stool. When you're ketogenic, we don't have enough volume of food usually, especially because if you get up on the fiber, you end up with up on the carbs. So Got in that it. first few weeks, when they, when they transition and they get the constipation, what I tell them to do is go get chia seeds. And chia seeds dry, go in one end, come out the other, and they do not change your blood sugar. Like I've had oh. several, probably, yeah, probably two, three dozen patients, two dozen for sure. Patients keep track of their sugars while they do this experiment for me. And I have them take a <laughs> tablespoon of uh, chia seeds and just swallow them down. You can chew or swallow or whatever you want. Just swallow them down every hour until you have a bowel movement. And okay. so that's a lot. That and, is. But what you've done is you've just increased the bulk back to what your bowels were used to. Okay. After you get, okay, a couple of ball movements, you feel less like, like stressed because you haven't had a ball movement. That sounds weird, but that's totally what people do. They're just like, oh, doc, I don't, I can't do this diet. My bowels can't take it. Yeah. Uh, then I say, okay, now I'll just start backing down. Maybe you have a tablespoon of those chia seeds, every, you know, four times a day. Maybe it's, you know, 
three times a day and you just keep taking away one of those tablespoons every, you know, I say three to four days. But your bowels will get used to not being stretched so hard. This is a this is a learned process. Got it. And when you go ketogenic, there's an improvement in the slime layer in your bowels as well. That doesn't happen in the first week. You got to get a little closer to keto adapted. That's the end of that second week, beginning of the third week, maybe even the end of the third week before you really have an improvement in those constipated patients. So that, that chia sense. seed transition is what I use. You know, the other thing that we get asked a lot or is a big discussion is when you go keto, like within the first couple of months, there's this massive hair loss. And they're mm-hmm. like, oh my God, what happens? What happens? What happens? So what do you say to that? Mm-hmm. So hair is, um, <laughs> think of hair as growing like a lawn. There are, it's not all growing at the same rate. Uh, there are some par- parts that are growing while some are falling out. At all times you are losing hair follicles and you're filling hair follicles. There's just the stable rate. And that depends on your age and your gender. And then these little things called fibroblasts, okay? Fibroblasts are part of collagen and how well you stimulate them, how well you make them. And we could go off on a side tangent for fibroblasts. Mm -hmm. When you have a a striking change in diet, so you've been on standard American diet, your sugars have been running in that 80 to 120 range, and now you're ketogenic and your sugars are definitely a different number, that signal sends out a danger warning and they lose hair. But I will contend what happens on a ketogenic diet is you just changed the fuel that's coming into the body. And now your supply chain, I use this word a lot, the supply chain that comes from fat. It improves the way we make sex hormones. It improves the way we make skin. It improves the way we make cells to turn over. And the hair that shows up in about 90 days after a ketogenic diet is stronger, thicker, uh, less breakable. That is supplied with a high fat setting, which is which is healthy. So a low fat diet, or I should just say a non ketogenic diet, and then the switch to keto, it sends out a signal: something just changed, something just changed. Yeah, and you'll lose hair. But I will so contend the hair that's going to come in in thirty days or ninety days, three months, is going to be stronger, more more flexible, the, the stretch break factor better. Um, okay. I think that answered it, right? Good. Did I answer it? Yeah, yeah, sure. John, did you have any more questions before I go on with more that the audience is asking? Um, I, I a, don't think so. I have a question for John. My big question was, what I should, when should I try the 36 hour again? And you answered it, do some more of the 24 hour stuff, which- I wanna know if you've lost weight. I did, I lost three pounds, but then I kind of just stalled out. Stalled out. So. Okay. So when when the other thing that we talked about a couple of weeks ago for you, you, you have this pain syndrome. Correct. And the pain syndrome can be just can wreck a plan. So I like Correct. to check in on a couple of those things that even though you might not have as much pain as you did the first week when we were trying to say, hey, let's change your diet and let's do let's take away your food, uh, we had you do something called a float. Right. And have you done a, one of those again or not? Just I just have. one? I'm you did. Two. Okay. Excellent. So when was the last one? Uh the day before oh, Jen right. left. So yeah, that would have been Thursday. 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 Yeah. And ha- could you see that it did any difference in the pain? Did, did that help your pain at all? I'm not really you know, it did help my pain in my lower back. I would say that. Uh, my knee is is just it, it bugger. Good days and bad days, and yesterday was a bad day. So, okay. just, well, it, the reason I bring it up is that pain syndromes are super. They're tough. Uh, it's the psychology of what the pain does to people. Switching things. I, I'm excited to see what your nerves are going to look like in six months. But it's between now and that six month time that you say help not push him too hard. We make little changes along the way. And then just that encouragement to say your nerves will heal. This is a nourishment thing as well. And especially after the history that you shared last week of just having a lot of the, you know, that lower testosterone, that lower energy, that mental 
I can't wait to see what your world looks like in six months if we can keep you on this diet uh, till then. So I, I touch in to say there's lots of other things we can do for pain syndromes. That float is kind of goofy. People say, does that really matter? I'm like, oh, it is an anti-inflammatory. It pulls that um, extra swelling out of knees and backs and just in replaces it with magnesium. So that's really important for mental health, but it's really important for pain syndromes too. So, so I, go ahead. So let me say, I get a lot of people asking, what is the float? And I know John and I, there's a spa next to us. There's a spa close to us and it's called a float spa. And you should Google it. When this is over, Google it because basically what it is, is it's this gigantic tub of Epsom salt bath, but it's got like tons of Epsom salt. And anybody living pounds, right? Yes. And we're all, everybody who's living today is, is deficient in magnesium and it is extremely important. So that's. Yeah, so Epsom salt is magnesium. It is. I mean, that's what it's a magnesium salt. And you know, they put it, they, they saturate the water. Like I think the viscosity of the water feels like it's like squishy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. It's so packed full of magnesium. And when you replace magnesium, it, it is an absolute that has to happen in the first couple of weeks of keto. But I contend anybody with mental health, meaning I just get sluggish, I can't focus, brain fog, or pain syndromes, we have to be magnesium heavy, meaning find a, an Epsom salt bath is great if you could do it in your own tub. Don't be cheap on the salt. Get six to eight cups in the bathtub. Yes. But yes. It, yes. Yeah, the best answer is one of these floats where you hang out in that tub for an hour or some of them it's an hour and a half. But that has got blood studies that said before the, before the Epsom salt uh, soaks and after it improves the magnesium. Um, still other ways you can improve magnesium, but this is a very effective way that I tend is, is a big staple for anybody with the pain syndrome that's using a ketogenic diet or not using a ketogenic diet, but you know, also... Uh, just powerful how important that is. So I'm glad to hear you've done two of them. That's really good. If, yeah, we if got you a membership. Make it, oh, yes. That's what I was going to say. If you can yeah. make it a routine until we get past these first three months, you're just, it sounds like a goofy thing to do. Like, that, like does it matter? Does it matter? I'm like, it matters. It matters. Try to keep that as a routine once a week as a treat to yourself. Um, that was what I, I did it with my kids on my birthday. So I, I, I think they're fun. I have two, I have boys and they're like, are we going to a spa, mom? And I'm like, it's a float spa. <laughs> and he's like, we're not going to be in the same tub, are we? And I'm like, <laughs> you're a little old. <laughs> when you're a baby. Our, our 13 year old liked it too. So, oh, it's great. And yeah. honestly, your teenagers are growing. Those bones, those neurons are all growing. And as parents, you can't get enough magnesium in your kids when they're growing. So, this is a great little treat. Don't tell them about the magnesium, just tell them it's fun and it's a treat. And, as a parent, you know, they like the purple. You're so buoyant in there. It's, it's impossible for you to, because of the magnesium level, it's impossible yeah. for you to sink. So it's, it's if, if anything, it's very relaxing. Extremely. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let me say just a few things real quick. I know we have a lot of questions. And for those, if we don't get to your questions, you can join um, a Facebook group called Low Carb Inspirations Plus Keto Friendly Recipes. We're very active in there. Um, but also, I do want to mention, um, Dr. Boz, you have a book called Any Way You Can, mm -hmm. and you got it with you? Yay, that's the book. Mm -hmm. I've already read it. John's already read it. I know that a lot of people in our group have already read it. I highly suggest it. If you are reading the book, tell us what chapter you're in. If you could just leave a comment, tell us what chapter you're in. Um, I would like to talk to uh, specifically about chapter 23, which is, I think, the autophagy um, chapter, oh. which I find so interesting, but, um, mm -hmm. I, I really want to talk about, well, the 12 hour fast, my autophagy, when I get to that, I know it's helping, but I want to talk about a couple things. First is that I really like, um, some things that are not on the ketogenic diet. Like I love pinto beans. So mm -hmm. I like to have hamburger, pinto beans, cheese, pico de gallo, anything, but the pinto beans are not allowed on keto, but there are some times and I totally did. That was my one cheat. I had, I think three tablespoons of pinto beans this week and my blood sugars, they didn't, I mean, my numbers were still great and oh, I don't, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, 
I'm just wondering, I've been so strict with my diet, but it seems like this fast of it, a minimum of 12 hours is doing more for me, even if I do have a glass of wine, or even if I do have pinto beans, it seems like the fast just gets me back quicker. But then also you do talk about, um, well, I'll let you answer that. But I also want you to mention the BHB salts. You just launched a brand new product this week on Amazon, and we've linked it in these show notes. But I also want you to talk about those salts and maybe when we go off plan, how you use those, why you use those. Can you tell us about that? Right. So again, you're like the perfect patient. <laughs> doctor, doctor, I cheated with pinto beans. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love you. Uh, so I have my diabetics who say, I cheated with two, two, two cupcakes. Uh, so you know, <laughs> the key to that though, is how much power you can find when you teach somebody to biohack themselves, to check themselves. That, you know, it sounds like this, you know, checking your, your system is meant for people with severe problems. Like the book is about my mom who was struggling. She was fighting for her life. We had cancer as our enemy. And, you know, I, we had ways we could check into her system, but we were in crisis. You don't have to be in crisis to biohack and say, let me understand your body. You know, if you say, you know, doc, I really like pinto beans. And I've been keto adapted. I peak ketones forever. I started checking my numbers and my ratio. Your ratios are great, Jennifer. I expected them to be worse. So you've mm -hmm. got glucose is in that 70, 80 range. You've got ketones above one. Those give you ratios that say, oh, she's going to hit autophagy really easy. Even if she goes out of like ketosis, like you, you burn up all your ketones and because you put so much glucose in, uh, your system is so adapted that you end up right back in that burning and producing ketones pretty quickly. Now, we didn't know that. I have a lot of people who say, oh, doc, I'm a, I'm, I don't cheat. I'm good on keto. I've been keto for a year. I don't, and I hear that a lot. <laughs> but when I start having them check, it, it, it's like, oh, wait a minute. That little tic-tac, and then maybe I had 15 of them, those mattered. <laughs> you know, those are things where patients like, I just didn't, it was so tiny and it, it didn't matter, but they start checking. And especially when you get that ratio, blood sugars are one thing, but the reason we want you doing, or in, at least in my, uh, in my clinic, the reason I want you doing a ketone and then, or a glucose and then dividing it by the ketone is it gives you a sense of what is that level of production doing for ketones in your system? And then what is the glucose? And when you've had struggles, like people say, you know, doc, I know Jennifer does a good job, but I got to have something sweet. If you're that person or another place that I really like to show this off is my patients who come in and say, doc, I'm on 70 units of insulin. How do I burn a ketone? Mm -hmm. Well, that's where these salts came in. So the salts I'm talking about are beta hydroxybutyrate. So back in the 1950s or 1960s, they made ketones. They put them in a lab and they attached them to salts like sodium, calcium, magnesium, potassium. Uh, and so you've got these ketones and then you have a salt. So we, we call them ketone salts. Now there's another thing out there that's much more expensive. These are plenty expensive to make, but the ketone salts are a great little biohack for somebody who has either fallen off the wagon and you wanna say, okay, you can't, <laughs> if you take these, bio, these ketone salts without any sugar substitute, they've been described to me as rocket fuel. And I don't mean that in the sense that they give you that much energy because they give you energy, but they taste terrible. Oh, so to find one that tastes good, they all have sugar substitutes in them. So when I was looking for one on the market, I wanted a good one with a good sugar substitutes. I don't really recommend sugar substitutes to people who are doing great. But if you're saying I need something sweet, then I'm going to biohack you. I want you to put in that sugar substitute with ketones. Because even if they have 100 units of insulin that they're shooting up and they've got blood sugars of 200, when you take down those ketones, those liver cells have to figure out what to do with those ketones. Those muscle cells have to figure out what to do with those ketones. And the first time you introduce that to your body, you're going to pee most of them out because your body's like, I haven't seen a ketone in a decade. Yeah. <laughs> but when they substitute with these little with the ketone and then they got that satisfaction of the sugar which is part of the addiction that's going to have to be addressed eventually but especially when they're struggling when they're having a tough time and they say what's the what's the best 
worst thing I can do? Or like, what's the best thing I can do to get through this terrible moment of I fell off the wagon or I'm really creating something sweet. I'm like, put something sweet in with ketones. Like okay. my kids okay. like it when I make a uh, heavy whipping cream and then those BHB salts, this one's raspberry. Uh, and so it's like a raspberry fat bomb and I know there's ketones in it. And so I'm like, yep, you can have the sugar substitute and you get a little ketones and the energy is the, the ketone energy, which is a longer energy than the spike and value nice. of a regular sugar. Oh, that's so good. those are some of the reasons why I, I, when I first got a ketogenic diet, I, I didn't recommend bio, the BHB salts for anybody, but I've really, really had to eat my words on that because there are a lot of people that they can't do what you do. They can't do what John is doing. They are too sick. And there isn't a private coach that says, like I had, my mom has, I could go and say, here, do this step next, do this step next. Yeah. But this biohack of adding the salts, this is what BHB is, beta hydroxybutyrate, put it in their diet, your body has to burn that. So those little mitochondria are having to wake up and say, hey, how do you burn a ketone? So yeah. that when they do transition, as they keep dropping that insulin and lowering the carbs, the cells have had those little mitochondria wake up and remember how to burn a ketone. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say is that the question that I see the most from people who are starting the diet is a cholesterol question, or I have gallbladder, gallbladder issues. I don't have a gallbladder. Will my cholesterol rise? Like, can we talk a little bit about gallbladder and cholesterol? Yeah, I actually, well, let's do gallbladder first. So okay. gallbladder, I did an actual like production video on this because I had so many people asking me about this. So if you go to my YouTube, there's actually a video on gallbladders. It's probably been out a month or so. So it's one of the newer ones because it's a common problem. Gallbladders store something called bile and bile is the, the kind of juices that your body puts around a fat globulate. Uh, in order to absorb it. So your gallbladder is just a storage bag. So when you eat, you both have gallbladders, right? Yes. Okay, so when you eat, your body put, has fat go into your tummy. And as that fat hits the stomach and the first couple of inches in your, in your intestines, it sends a message saying, hey, I need some, gall I need some, uh, some bile. The bile, if it's stored in the bag, psh, it squirts it out into the intestines. It kind of emulsifies all these fats, and that's how you absorb them. If you don't have a gallbladder, that same message gets gets pushed upstream to the liver, which is where these bile, which is where bile is made. And the secretion of bile will come as a response to fat. The first week you don't have a gallbladder, yeah, you're going to have some diarrhea. Your body hasn't figured out how to live without a gallbladder. But after you've been without a gallbladder for a while, when the fat goes in, your body has learned, this is when you secrete that, there's no storage. So they learn the liver has to produce that and it is secreted and you emulsify the fats. Uh, you know, one of the questions I always ask patients who've had a gallbladder and they say, well, is it working? Do, you know, am I making enough bile? I ask them, well, does your poop float? <laughs> I know it's a gross question, but if you're, if you're pooping out fat, that hasn't been emulsified, that there's no there's no bile in it, then it floats. And it takes like two or three flushes for it to go down the toilet. Uh, <laughs> that's real. <laughs> so I, I say, who cleans your toilet? And of course, usually if it's, okay. Many times it's not them. I'm like, whoever cleans your toilet, if there is fat in the toilet bowl, yes. that is yes. a signal that your gallbladder really is, is, you really do actually you know, you need to go see the doctor. Uh, that, you gotta talk about that with, uh, with the doctor. Wait, so you if, do need to see the doctor? If you have the kind of stool where it's taken two or three flushes, there's so much oil in your stool that it leaves oh. an oily slick in the toilet. <laughs> and those are the people whose gallbladder, there's something more than just a gallbladder. That's not from your gallbladder. Oh. But that's, and many times they've said, ah, oh, I can't eat a ketogenic diet. I have, when I put fat in, I get this explosive diarrhea. I have all these problems. I get this gas. And that's that's a hint to me the doctor saying okay something's not right sometimes it's you have been eating low fat for two decades and the yes. little bitty cells in your bowel that 
in, in your intestines that absorb fat, they're all sleepy. They're hibernating. They haven't had any reason to wake up because you eat so much low fat. You don't eat fat. So the first week they eat ketogenic, they're the ones who are screaming, saying, those people with constipation, I want to meet them. And you're like, because <laughs> they're, they're having really bad troubles. And if I had to get, if I had to put a plea for the people who I would say, do not, do not give up on this diet. It is for those people with oily stools because they're having a malabsorption. They have a real problem. You should see their brain scans. Mm. They have not been absorbing fat and the fat is how they repair. It's unbelievable. You know, okay. So I've been doing this diet for a long time, like uh, more than a year and a half. And I do remember not the bowel problems that you're talking about. I mean, if I ate too much fat or whatever, but I remember a film over the toilet commode, like a film. And there's a lot of people that do talk about like an oily film. I don't know if it's still there. I don't think I notice it anymore, but. Well, um, I mean, and there's a mismatch there too. So when you get the oily film on the top of the water, but it still flushes down the toilet without much trouble, then you may have had so much fat and it moved through the bowel just quick enough that you didn't emulsify all the fat. And you're like, okay, okay. But it's not the, no doc, this happens every time I have a bowel movement, there is an oily slick in that toilet. This is nasty. Something's wrong. They know something's wrong and they're right. Something's wrong. And that's what I would have to work through with the patient. So if you're on a, a no fat diet back in the mm -hmm. day, in the nineties, I had a friend that went, you know, he eats snack well, cookies all day but he wouldn't have an ounce of fat he lost a lot of weight mm -hmm. and then he reached his goal weight and him and his wife went out and had like a steak dinner or something high in fat and then that night he had to have his gallbladder out because <laughs> i guess you know oh, and, and, yeah it, it, it's a real thing it happened he had to go to the emergency room because i guess the gallbladder if it's not processing yeah. any, your body's not processing any fat it goes it's like I, i'm out of a job and then all of a right. sudden, so, here comes all this fat at once, and it freaks out, I guess. No, oh, it's a great story. It's a perfect teachable moment. So here's what happened with that guy. So the gallbladder is a muscle, okay? It should be exercised. And if you have, if you ever had your arm in a cast, and then you take the cast out, and that muscle is just kind of like, whoa, I can hardly, like, lift my arm up, you know? that Those muscles are not in shape. So if he has been saying, we are not using our muscle at all, my muscle gets used when we eat fat but we don't have any reason to use our muscle. And now we just put all of, we like, when we ran a 26.2 marathon and he's, the gallbladder squeezing and squeezing and squeezing and squeezing. And especially if they're unlucky enough to have little bitty stones in the gallbladder, stones happen when that gall or that um, bile sits still, it doesn't get flushed. So that has been sitting there and sitting there and that the gallbladder's job is to make it more and more and more concentrated and that concentration turns into a stone eventually. It precipitates. And if it's gravel, the danger is the first time you squeeze, if the gall, if the little gravelly stones are just a little bit bigger than the hoses, you plug it. And that is a surgical emergency. Ooh. So your guy, yeah, he that's what he did. Oops. <laughs> there was a question so there. Yeah, we have a question. So um, somebody is asking thoughts on trace minerals for help with hair loss. Okay, so this is a great, so the questions I'd want to know from, uh, is it Jessica? La? Uh, I, I would want to know how long she's been keto. So if she's had that hair loss and she's within the first like three months of keto, mm -hmm. I'd really want to make sure she's peeing a ketone. Like, don't be going in and out of ketosis. If you're having hair loss, we need your nourishment started and you need to persist for the good three months. That's how long it takes a hair follicle to go from bottom to, to you can see little bitty fuzzies on there. So if you've just started a ketogenic diet, they go through that hair loss and it hasn't been three months, just stay the course. But if yeah. you've kind of like been dabbling, I've been keto for six months and the hair loss is terrible, then I'm saying you need to be checking things. Something's up because either you're going in and out of ketosis um, and you're not really having that high nourishment, low anti-inflammatory, so low inflammation. Um, and they'll be stuck with minimal hair growth and yet they've lost it and then they get really crabby. Yeah. So, I think for me, when I first started, I mean, it was a long time ago, but I remember I did have hair loss. 
And I think what was happening is there's a protein goal I was supposed to meet and I was trying to meet fat, but I wasn't eating enough of anything. So I wasn't meeting my protein goal and I definitely wasn't eating enough fat. And the problem was, is I could barely get the calories in and I did start losing hair for like a month. And then now, next thing you know, I was, I had collagen here, collagen there. I was loading up on collagen to really help with that. Do you think collagen does help with that? Well, so the part that I worry about is what happened to you is that it is a very common problem that people say, I'm on this for weight loss and this is the rules of weight loss and I'm not going to eat as much. But the key to a nourished body, hair is a, is a reflection of nourishment. And so if you've got hair loss, it's because many times it's because the body's signal is um, you're not eating enough. And I don't mean that in snack more times a day. I mean, when you actually eat, I want you to have a surge of hormones, a surge of growth hormone, which is where you stimulate those fibroblasts that I was talking about for collagen production. You know, people take collagen supplements and there's science behind that. But first and foremost, they need to eat until they can feel satiety. They can feel satiated like, oh, I'm full. Okay. Now that was the one thing that I gave you a, a, an assignment for last week was to say, I don't want you fasting any more hours. But I do want to know when you were doing your beef and butter fast, mm -hmm. did you really be mindful about, okay, how much did I eat? And did I eat these, this volume because that's what I've been doing for the better part of a year? Or did I stop eating when I felt that fullness? Uh, there's times that I cannot eat anymore. And I felt so full. But the beef and butter fast is the perfect ketogenic diet. It is. I have, when I came up with the beef and butter fast, I took the ratios that you need. I took the macros that you need with the seasonings. And I have all these recipes. Um, people are going to ask where it is, but it's on beefandbutterfast.com is the whole experiment that we did. And every time I do that fast, I lose weight. It works perfectly, but I cannot finish my dinner. I eat such perfect food that my stomach just seems to get smaller and smaller because I'm, I'm supposed to eat this amount. I eat really well. And then there's just that little bit that you can't finish anymore. Right. So that's the key though. Go ahead. I, I have a problem with sometimes having too much protein because I'm, we spoke with that in your book, too much protein can turn into sugar or mm -hmm. glucose. So like I, one meal in particular, I went to a barbecue place. It's a great place. Had a big, huge beef rib and uh, it was delicious. But at the end of the meal, I could tell I didn't, I didn't feel right. And I think I had too much protein compared to the fat and mm. my, I, I didn't, I didn't write them down, but that my, I went home and checked my numbers and it showed my glucose was high. And okay. uh, that's Perfect. another thing you got to be careful is, is to not have too much protein. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it sounds like the right thing to, to, to <clears throat> do protein in our minds sounds like the healthy thing to do. <laughs> when I explain this diet to patients or to, you know, anybody that asks like a church or somebody that's not into the ketogenic diet, they're like, what do you mean you eat all fat? It, it, our culture has taught us not to do that. But one of the responses to protein is this insulin surge. You'll, you'll find yourself producing insulin and mobilizing glucose when you have excessive protein. So, you know, and it's interesting that you could feel it. I think that's the key you know, do I think that you're going to do these blood tests from now until the time you die? No, there is no diet that should be this heavily monitored. We're doing this monitoring in you guys, A, because we're trying to teach a huge audience of people that have very similar questions. We're trying to get information out in a way that's very specific to two people, um, but also extrapolate the teachable moments to the audience. When looking at, you know, long term, uh, your body, Jennifer, you did this wonderful job making a beef and butter fast, which is like a brilliant, brilliant idea, by the way, uh, and for how do you get satiety? And you calculated it all out and you wrote the recipe, but your body told you differently. Your body said, Jennifer, I'm full. And that means that your body has got hormones that are surging to say, her growth hormone surged, her satiety, her leptin surge, you know, all of the stuff that says, no, 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 we're full. Those hormones all come from that upstream uh, profile of fats. 
And when you're on a high fat diet, this does not fix right away. But it is if you can teach it right. And part of that teaching is we need nothing going in for 12 hours and the rest of it will will course correct. We check your numbers so that you can learn about you. And then hopefully this audience can say, well, maybe I should try that. It sounds like it's somebody else's problem until you say, well, I wonder if I would lose weight if I do that. Mm -hmm. And 12 hours of strict fasting is you don't need a doctor to do that. <laughs> Those are pretty easy, but if you hear these questions and get them answered, hopefully that's where it will translate into a much better result for you and for the people listening. Yeah, so, so we have a question. Uh, Diana is asking, what is the beef and butter fast? So sorry, I didn't explain that very well. It is um, a fast that I've created where you eat beef and butter. It's a high fat, moderate protein with a uh, a little bit of seasoning to change it up every day. We do this for four days and average statistically people lose about four pounds. We've had, um, I think the last time we uh, did a challenge, 150 people lost an average of 4.05 pounds. So we are making a difference. We do this challenge once a month. Um, there's a group called the low, uh, the beef and butter fast five day challenge. That's the official group that I run that helps people. You know, it does two things. Not only does it give you very quick weight loss, but it also teaches you very strict car, uh, very strict keto. It teaches you here's the amount of protein, here's the amount of fat, and here's the amount of carbs. And people are shocked. They're shocked when they go through it and they immediately see what they're doing wrong on the ketogenic diet. So it's just a it's just a very simple way to teach people. And it's it's like once you get that knowledge, you see how your body reacts and you can use it to to we have a whole substitution list. A lot of people think, oh, you just have to eat beef and butter. But no, it's the combination of fat to protein to carb. And that's a simple way of teaching it. So when I go that's back what to the place with that beef rib, I'm gonna bring a stick of butter. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> The frosting needs to be buttered. Perfect. That's yeah. how you fix that ratio. And I think, you know, the, the other part about Jennifer is how you know, her strictness up to this point almost guarantees that she was really teed up to say, I just need to tap in and use the hormones that you've been nourishing your body with, but just didn't have the right little guidelines to say, here, here's how you do this. This is, you're so close to the, to the right answers. Um, I mean, very, very, very good. You make it your easy patient, Jennifer. Oh, thank you. I, I've been trying for so hard. April, I mean, it was February of 2017. And the only reason why I remember this is because it was February 7th when I started the keto diet. But I remember very vividly February 14th. John goes, hey, let, I'm going to take you out to dinner for Valentine's Day. And I'm like, no, no, because you I don't trust any it. restaurant. I, I didn't want, and he's like, what the heck? He goes, you're pretty, you're still doing that diet? Like he thought I was already going to be done in a week. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm kind of liking this. And he's like, well, what do we do for Valentine's Day? And I said, we go to Costco and we get those nice thick steaks and we have grilled steaks. And a stick of butter. Yeah, yeah. And a stick of butter. Absolutely. No, that's great. Great. Well, this has been great. I think we're going to just about wrap it up a little bit early. If you have not gotten Dr. Bosworth's book, um, look at the link in this broadcast and you can get you can get the hard copy book. You can get an audio an audio version or you can get a Kindle version. I've already bought, I think, five of them because not only did I get the audio for me, I got it for my husband, but I sent it to three of my friends because it was that good. It's really, really, really good information. But not only the book helps you to understand, but then we also have the discussion here, which mm -hmm. is also extremely helpful. So let us know if you're watching the replay, hashtag replay. If you need meal plans, um, I write up meal plans every week, just the food that I feed my family. I send that out on a weekly basis. So if you need meal plans, just write hashtag meal plans and I will give you the link so that you can sign up for our emails. Um, Dr. Bosworth, is there anything uh, else you wanna add? You know, I get lots of private messages asking me, will you see me for as a ketogenic diet? Will you see me for ketosis? And 
this is my first like public way of saying there is such a hunger for information that if you share this to people who are interested to say, yes, there are doctors out there that study this. I'm not the only one. I just happen to be brave enough to push record on the social media stuff. But really uh, saying a, a, a grand thank you for Jennifer reaching out you know, as part of reading the book and understanding that, inviting her husband to say, if you'll be patients live on social media, it would answer so many questions that I have that I can't keep up with. So I just want to say thank you for being brave enough to do this. Sure. And then for the folks out there watching, you know, if you post questions on here, we do try to answer them. We're trying to use this as a forum to say, there are a lot of questions. You don't, you, you can learn a lot by watching me take care of two people on a ketogenic diet. Uh, and I think that is uh, not only a reassurance that it's safe, but also just how do you get through some of the quirks? Yeah. So, John, do you have anything else you want to add? Nothing other than it's a great book. I don't read books. I started probably <laughs> yeah. seven books in my life and put them down after the first chapter. But this one's awesome. I couldn't I couldn't put it down. It's very good information, very well said, um, and, and how you take the science and break it down where we can understand it. It's great. great if, you, if you need the link to that book, it is in the description of this video, along with the blood meter that we use to track our numbers. We will tell you the specific blood meter. We talk about Dr. Boz's exogenous ketones, that raspberry lemon, I believe it was. Mine's coming tomorrow, I think. Um, you, there's, you a, some, there's a, there's a, got some mail in, you got a bunch of packages. Oh, I probably got it. So when I get home, I'll get it. But there's a lot of links in the description of this video. So if you need anything or want to reference anything that we talked about, we probably put it in there. And if not, we will add it later. So thank you guys for being on and we will definitely see you next week. See you next week. All right. Okay. See thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Please subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to click the notification bell so you don't miss out on any new videos. Stay tuned.